Good morning, friends, and welcome to this service on the 12th of September. It, uh, it is a service that starts a new series, a new preaching series. Uh, in the month of, of September, we're in our stewardship phase, where we're looking at the church's finances for the last um, three quarters of a year. And we're also looking at our plans for 2022. In the time of pandemic, it's hard to make plans, but we do have to make plans. And we believe that God has so much for us to do in this neighborhood. Listen to Dawn Brown now as she reads that well-known passage, the parable of the sower. Good morning. Our reading today comes from Matthew 13, 1 to 17, the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand or hear. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men longed to see what you did but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. God always blesses the reading of his holy word. Today we begin a new preaching series, just four weeks long. It's a recurring series. Every spring the treasurer and the admin team sit down to look and pray about the church's finances. By mid-October we will be able to see how the finances have held or improved for the first three quarters of the church's financial year. We will then be able to set up a budget meeting for the following year, in this case, 2022. This we then take to council, where we think and pray again about the priorities in the church before finding final agreement. Whatever the circumstances, it is incumbent upon me as your minister to teach about faithful Christian giving, generosity and sharing. I guess the only way to start such a series is to focus on God, who is of course the greatest giver of all. This series will end on Commitment Sunday, Sunday the 3rd of October 2021. We're going to ask you to fill in a card, but the filling in of the card is of course preceded by prayer, a conversation with God in which you and God decide what's best for you to give. Each person has to do this for themselves, each family. Paul writes it this way to the Corinthians. Each person should give what they have decided in their hearts to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. 
And that's 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 10 and verse 8. You will appreciate why it would be wrong of you to think of your tithe as a subscription to membership in the church or like a donation that you might give to a charity for good work or some kind of emergency money to keep the doors of the church open. That's not why we give. We give A, because God has been so generous with us and B, so we also can learn God's ways and be like Him. One of the most well-known parables that Jesus ever told was the parable of the sower. It's so well known that our Bible society here in South Africa has traditionally used the logo of the sower uh, in its uh, advertising. We know it so well. We heard this parable in Sunday school. We even think we know the meaning well. Maybe or maybe not. In summary, the parable goes like this. One, a sower or a farmer or a farm laborer goes out to sow seeds in planting season. Two, some seeds are sown and fall upon the footpath. Some seeds fall upon rocky ground. Some seeds fall upon thorny soil and some seeds fall on good fertile soil. Depending on where they land, the seeds are either eaten up by birds, spring up quickly and then wither, get choked by thorns, while some of them, roughly about a quarter, take root and grow. Quite apart from the numerous other problems, what do we make of a sower who throws seeds in such an unlikely, seemingly unproductive manner. Notwithstanding the neglect of best agricultural practices, what sort of worldview is suggested by someone who throws seeds on a well-worn path or on rocky ground where it is unlikely that they will grow or among thorns that are likely to choke them? We are Scottish Presbyterians, for goodness sake. We scratch our heads and we wonder at such a foolish waste of seed and other precious resources on the part of the sower. The logical place to sow seed, of course, is on good soil. And we readily take this message to heart. Even if we are not farmers, the lesson here is applied to our every situation. One commentator has written, if you ever want to plant a church, then surely you must plant it carefully in a carefully scrutinized way, a sure-to-grow neighborhood. If you ever decide to double your church's membership, then surely you must craft your message for a promising demographic and to reach out to people who are motivated and purposeful and driven enough to receive that message and do something about it. You need to be strategic about the location. Like any self-respecting hamburger outlet or petrol station or grocery shop, you need to maximize your effort toward the arena of greatest result. In terms of the sower, you need to find the good soil, surely, and throw your seed only on that soil. It's just good business. It seems obvious that the sower in the text is anything but a good business person. He seems to be willing to just fling the seed anywhere where he, we have assumed, like many other parables, we've assumed that the story is about us. You know that song of Carly Simon? You're so vain, you probably think the song is about you. The parable is more often than not about God. Take the parable of the prodigal son for an example. The parable of the prodigal son is more about God than about the son. So this one may be more about the sower than the soil. And another thing, maybe this parable should be called the hundredfold harvest. The commentator Talita Arnold writes, even if the harvest were only thirtyfold, 
the story would end in a miracle. Sevenfold meant a good year for the farmer. And tenfold meant true abundance. Thirtyfold would feed a village for a whole year. And a hundredfold would let the farmer retire to a villa by the Sea of Galilee. Didn't it ever strike you as just plain fascinating that the soil was not cultivated prior to sowing? I've read that farmers in Jesus' time cast the seed and then plowed the land. With this scattershot approach, it is no surprise that some seed falls on hard soil. Other seed falls on ground too rocky for good roots and still other seed among thorns and weeds. Those are the facts of life and everyone knows it, including Jesus. Arnold goes on to write that preaching is a little bit like sowing. Like Jesus, she says, preachers cast the gospel as broadly as the sower in the parable does with no guarantee where the seed will land. On Sunday mornings, we look out on our congregations of people who are here for all kinds of reasons. There is the newcomer who is just church shopping or trying out Christianity. There is the person in crisis who will vanish when things get better. There is the family who comes just for the children but then quits when the children's soccer season starts. Standing in front of them all is the preacher, who has poured out heart and soul in the sermon in the hope that something will take root, but she also knows her odds are not any better than the sower's. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because sowing is what sowers do. It is fascinating to me that the great sower spends no time at all worried about the soil. He accepts the fact that some seed, a goodly portion of it, will fall on bad soil. And he keeps sowing because that is what sowers do. God is so generous with us. And contrary to the parable of the talents, so far God has kept sowing although most times we have made a tremendous mess of things. The story does not end with the inhospitable soils, though most sermons do. The story does not even end with a normal harvest from the good soil. It ends with a miracle, a hundredfold harvest. It is our job to trust and to preach that possibility as well. Our God is generous. Some commentators, exasperated by the generosity of the father of the prodigal son in Luke 15, suggest that the parable should much rather be called the parable of the prodigal father. Why? Because they think God's forgiveness is too much. It is excessive, wasteful, prodigal. But that's just how our God is. God's generosity is not planned, calculated and just enough. God's generosity is excessive. Frederick Beekner so beautifully describes this concept called grace that Christians find so hard to understand. Grace is something you can never get, but can only be given. There's no way to earn it or deserve it, or bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream, or earn good looks, or bring about your own birth. A good sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Somebody loving you is grace. Loving somebody is grace. Have you ever tried to love somebody? A crucial eccentricity of the Christian faith is the assertion that people are saved by grace. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. 
There is nothing that you have to do. The grace of God means something like this. Here is your life. You might never have been, but you are. Because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It is for you that I created the universe. I love you. But there is one catch. Like any other gift in life, the gift of grace can only be yours if you reach out and accept it. Being able to reach out may be a gift as well. And the novelist Robert Farrar Capon sniffs out the Pharisee in each of us when he writes, you're worried about permissiveness, about the way pre the preaching of grace seems to say it's okay to do all kinds of terrible things, as long as you just walk in afterward and take the free gift of God's forgiveness. While you and I might be worried about seeming to give permission, Jesus apparently wasn't. He wasn't afraid of giving the prodigal son a kiss instead of a lecture, a party instead of probation. And he proved that by bringing in the elder brother at the end of the story and having him raise pretty much the same objections as you do. He's angry about the party. He complains that his father is lowering standards and ignoring virtue. That music and dancing and a fatted calf are, in effect, just so many permissions to break the law. And to that Jesus has the Father say only one thing. Cut that out. We're not playing schoolboys and bad boys, good boys and bad boys anymore. Your brother was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. The name of the game from now on is resurrection, not bookkeeping. And so at the end of the parable, you may be struck with more questions than answers. This parable of the sower. However you feel about the ridiculous character of the sower, remember that discipleship delights in God's abundance. At the heart of any father's optim farmer's optimism is the experience of bounty. So, we may have lost the tomatoes this year. But this year's cabbage crop was abundant. And the spinach was plentiful. And the squashes just grew and grew and grew. There is so much more to be thankful for. And truth be told, it all came by God's abundant grace. And so here at the beginning of the stewardship series, I offer you the parable of the sower. The parable challenges us to believe in God's abundance. Remember, if the parable ended with a sevenfold harvest from good soil, that would have been, as the Jews say, day and new. That would have been enough. However, this parable is not simply pragmatic. It is also filled with promise. That promise, even in the face of rejection and the reality of the world, Novelist B.B. Moore Campbell writes, Some of us have that empty barrel kind of faith, walking around expecting things to run out, expecting that there isn't enough air or enough water, expecting that someone is going to do you wrong. The God I serve told me to expect the best, that there is enough for everybody. And so, what can you and I do? Well, like the sower, we must spread seed extravagantly. Jesus calls us to trust in the abundant ways of God. He wants us to be generous just as our Heavenly Father is generous. Generosity takes on a life of its own. Whatever effort you exert, whatever money you give, whatever skill you use to work for God, God will make it more. He will take your little and it will make it more, so much more, more than we can ask for or even imagine. Until you wonder if what you gave has anything to do with the ultimate result. 
those who have experienced God's generosity will tell you. They can testify to the results of a harvest when God has been involved. And so, dear friends, this week, we follow, we imitate, we mimic a generous God.